It's iconic. The most famous police sketch in history is the Unabomber. The terrorist called Unabomber is planning to blow up an airliner sometime during the next six days. He's targeting airlines, scientists, computers, forestry people. We have done every kind of victimology. His victims are totally random. That profile is wrong. He's lonely. He's smart, extremely precise. He feels underappreciated, victimized, and he's angry. You figure out the philosophy, you can figure out the man, you can crack the code. An operation of this size and scale is unprecedented. We believe it to be a singular opportunity to lure the Unabomber into the light. You have the full support of the DOJ. I All I have to do is write your name on a box, and I can reach out and touch anyone, anywhere. If a box comes with your name on it, you can't even imagine doing anything other than obeying. The FBI recommendation is that we publish the manifesto. This is the reckoning. He's been outsmarting us the whole time. Everybody's wrong except for you. I know him like I know myself. We need a guilty plea from Ted. This is our only shot. You're our only shot. And hunt you the bummer. Hey guys, thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Uh, who is uh, very intrigued by that trailer? Are you ready to see the show? It's, it's amazing. It's like a it's like a movie. I watched the first uh, episode or two since the premiere is two hours, correct? Great. Um, so, Greg, we've seen your work on House and Lost and and shows like that. But what made you uh, want to take on a project like Manhunt Unabomber? Um, I started my career doing America's Most Wanted mm -hmm. and doing reenactments and dramatizing real stories. And I was working on that show during Unabomber and remember the case well, followed the case and was fascinated by it. And when I got the script and I've never seen anybody crack the story, I was just blown away that, that Jim was a real person and this was a real story. And as I researched it further after reading the pilot, I just had to be involved with it. Yeah, were you uh, into the idea that it, it would work better as a mini-series over a film? Because um, TV is kind of where it's at right now. There's so much content and, and amazing things being done on television. So the, the story landed perfectly into eight episodes. I mean, the first night is the is two hours, and it's the first two episodes. Um, but it it naturally, you know, when I went got the job, flew to DC, and met with Real Fits, and got the download, everything just landed perfectly into that. I don't know how you could tell the story and just two hours, it really needs. Every episode is almost a pilot unto itself because the moves are so dramatic and stranger than fiction. Yeah, and how about you, Sam? What drew you uh, to be a part of it? Uh, were you like eager to find a mini series or was it something that um, you thought you could really take on the role of Fitz? Uh, I, I did a movie, I did a couple of movies, did like Everest and Hacksaw Ridge, which were based on true stories. And I kind of found the non-fiction side a bit more compelling sometimes than some of the, the fiction stories that I'd read. And I thought that I knew about the Unabomber. I thought I knew about the, the sketch and, you know, the, the how he got caught. But then when I read the series and it came to me, I was like, well, I knew 99% of this is new to me. So I kind of, that really drew me to it. Um, and I like being able to tell a story from a different angle. So this is something you think you know about, but the way we've approached it, um, thanks to uh, the character of James Fitzgerald, you kind of uh, get a new insight into you know, this reign of terror that the Unabomber had. Yeah. What kind of research did you do uh, to prepare? I know, uh, I'm sure you sat down with James Fitzgerald. And uh, I sat down with him brain. very late, to be honest, because I've learned from experience that if you play someone that's real, they have a different perception of themselves when you ask them, like, can you tell me who you are? So if you're trying to play them, it's like if I asked you who you were 20 years ago, you're going to have a different idea. You're going to probably embellish it or uh, do it through a filter. So I kind of held off from talking to him. So I, but I watched a lot of, he, he'd written a lot of books, so I watched a lot of interviews he did on YouTube. I listened to hours and hours of tapes when he sat down with Greg and the writer and told them the story. And what I found fascinating was the times when he was 
on mic but forgot he was on mic, like going to the bathroom or talking to someone in the corridor. You started to see him with his guard down and get an idea of what he was like. And then uh, I'd send him a questionnaire, massive questionnaire, like hundreds of questions from the bigger picture questions to the smaller minutia, like are you left-handed, right-handed, kind of thing, to, and everything in between to just kind of gauge your way in. And he's a very literal guy, so that every answer came back. He didn't balk on anything, even the personal stuff. He kind of wrote massive paragraphs for me. So eventually I kind of gauged an idea of how I wanted to get into him. And because no one knew this guy existed to, for in this whole investigation, I was thinking, well, why haven't we heard about him? What happened? What did he do to people to piss them off so much that no one's talked about him? Yeah. Um, or did he just, was he just very humble? Did he not want to be involved? And that was the angle I was trying to find. Why haven't we heard about him? And what is this guy? So you use all the other kind of information around him before you actually go to the man himself. And so when I met, met him eventually, I kind of was pretty spot on just by the sense of deduction of who this guy was and why we haven't heard about him. Yeah. Yeah, having like the fact that nobody had really heard of this character that was really at the center of making all of the points that the public knew happen and to be able to tell that story and give due to Jim was like also really appealing because you not only saw that he didn't get his due, you also saw people shamelessly taking credit for his work over the there years. There were bumper stickers at the time of, yeah, hey, I caught the Unabomber too, because so many people were standing up and taking credit because this guy was such a prolific terrorist that once he was caught, he, you know, he was, no one caught him for 16 years. And so he, no one knew anything about him. He was that elusive. So finally when he was caught, it was such a celebration that I think, you know, this story got swept to the side, but this story is the most important. This is the one that cracked the case. Um, Greg, what kind of research did you do into the, the story to kind of get Jim's story out of it and pull that uh, to the forefront? Jim wrote a chapter in a larger book uh, about profilers that was really the, the basis of some of the key moments and then flying to D.C., going to see the cabin, which is in the museum in Washington, D.C. Yeah, that I actually just went to the museum and I saw it there. Oh, it was amazing, an awesome right? FBI exhibit. It's I took hundreds of photos of it when I was there for my future production designer. You got flagged by the I government. I got flagged. <laughs> we got stopped. And then I'm like, I'm here with the man that caught the Unabomber. And they're like, uh-huh, sure. Like, uh, oh, really? You were wearing a hoodie yeah, a little well, bit like... like like that, I had some fetish about like the the cabin. So, um, spent about three days with Jim, just getting as much information. Read multiple books on it, a lot of different perspectives. We had access to you know some of the case file and Ted's unpublished autobiography and journaling and things like that. So it was just a matter of consuming. But it's great because there was a finite amount of material that I could consume in a short period of time, and, and you know, including reading the manifesto. And how did you go about like creating the look for the series? Um, how you wanted it to feel, the vibe of uh, you know the cinematography and all of that, the direction. Watchable yeah. was important. Not making it overly arty and and trying to outsmart the audience. It was really my, my like first goal when I first came on was how do I make it inclusive for the audience? How do all these new uh, lingo and new ideas get across to the audience? And how do we how do we message that? Because and because that, that's if you're not on Fitz's journey, I I'm not you know getting Sam. He's on you know we're on the emotional journey and that's taken care of. I wanted to make sure that all the stuff that Fitz was going through was uh, along for the ride in the audience. So we saw a lot of like we called genius porn. We saw we watched a lot of films that have had you know blackboard scenes and things just to see how like what of those things had we watched probably like fifty or sixty examples of anything from you know, theory of everything on a blackboard to back to the future when they're like, you know, using uh, the models to explain a concept. So in episode three and you have the nachos or you have some of these whiteboard scenes, we use those tangible examples to keep everybody in the show. Because it's, it's hard, you, when you, even when you read the script, you know, this, isn't a, this is like a, you know, the duality of these two guys, but it's basically the kind of idea of how this guy caught him for the use of language. And that was the weird thing I'd never read. You know, I'd, you always think the FBI are finding hairs and blood and things like that. But in truth, this guy invented he, his own kind of style of capturing criminals. And at the time, it was, you know, it was looked on as, all right, go away, man. You're making stuff up. It doesn't exist what you're creating. But he was a rebel and kept pushing and pushing because he truly believed that he could catch someone through the use of the, how they speak and what they write. And when the Unabomber sent his 56-page manifesto, that gave him everything he needed. And he trolled it for every variant, spelling, every grammatical error, every kind of axiom he could find in order to pull out a profile. 
of who he thinks this guy was. And it was complete opposite to what they had for 16 years. And he stuck to his guns and said, I'm telling you, the way this guy writes and the way he speaks, this will help us. It's crazy. I know the museum has some of the letters he wrote. Or Did you guys get a chance to look at the actual manifesto of the Unabomber? Yeah, I, I got it off Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> so I got flagged too. <laughs> and the, and the, the, the handwritten copy was in the case file. It was in like, the evidence and, and copies of that yeah, we had. And that's how we created the cabin to its very detail. In fact, the cabin was at the premiere last night and we could, you know, people could walk in. It's, you know, it's 10 by 12. The only adjustment we made was Paul is six inches taller than Ted was. So we made it a little bit bigger, but every detail, everything that people see in it is exactly, you know, museum level recreation of the way he lived. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Paul, who's great in this show too. Um, a, an incredible cast. You guys are so talented. You have Chris Noth and, and Jane Lynch and Brian Darcy James, Sam. Um, Tell us about how you found that cast and pulled everyone together for this awesome miniseries. You know, when I when I came on, Discovery's like, we want to swing big for this. We like really believe in it and believe that we've got something and want to see if we can attract good talent. It's a great time in television. People are, you know, the line between movies and film continues to blur. And I think to be able to tell a longer story and to have com compelling material. And it, you know, we first reached out to Sam and, you know, that, got interest and it was really it was like really exciting to get that was like very validating to see because I you know I followed Sam's work and can see that that was you know he was this was going to be an opportunity as Sam said in one scene he's like I had more dialogue in that scene in the last 20 years of my movies <laughs> and it was really exciting because like you know I saw Sam in the debt and like loved that movie and just really mm -hmm. like hung on to that as an opportunity to see like like take it out and like try all these gears out and it was incredible what we would continue to discover together and then with that came you know the and the material kept speaking to people you know it spoke to you know we have a standalone episode uh episode six which should be like the fifth night um is just you know about ted's origins and how ted became ted and you know goes into different key moments of his life that shaped him including mk ultra and how he was weaponized by the government so and then brian you know coming in and the and you know mark duplass to play david each you know these iconic characters it was you know great opportunity for everybody to, to come in and work with good material and I try to stay out of everybody's way when that happens. Yeah. And for you, Sam, was it, you know, you mentioned the emotional journey that Fitz goes on in this show. Was it important for you to kind of uh, play a character where you can live with it for a while? I mean, eight episodes of one person rather than just a two-hour movie? It's different. I, I, look, I tend to not to look at the medium. I tend to look at the story. I've done big movies, uh, indie movies, TVs, commercials, video games. So it's more the story. And uh, is the character going to be something I want to live with? Not just for, say, four or five months over an eight-episode eight arc, but, you know, is it something I want to live with just on a day-by-day -day basis? Um, because sometimes, you know, you can do stuff where you can get bored and that's impossible then to go home. But the thing about this was, yeah, there was more information that kept you in, involved. Like, there was stuff coming out, like... The, the, the most iconic thing is the picture of the, the Unibomber. Yeah. <laughs> the thing I didn't realise is that actually isn't the Unibomber. <laughs> um, when, they, when they did the original sketch, one woman saw that original sketch and then it's about five years later they got the task force together again and they wanted a new sketch. So they brought the woman back in and said, well, can you describe the, the picture again? And that's how we got that iconic picture. The problem with that is she was remembering the sketch artist that she saw five years ago. Now, that kind of information, that's what kept me coming back. That's what kept me going, yeah, this is something Stranger I want to be involved picture. with. Because, yeah, you couldn't make that up. Yeah. Um, so that's what I look for. I, I don't look at the, the size of the, 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 the part or the medium or anything like that. And just, you know, even exploring the ideas uh, of language, you know, I think, like, arrival, like, would, like, set the stage in terms of linguistics and what it is, but also that, you know, these idea of, like, your idiolect, the idea that everybody has a uni unique way of writing that they cannot hide and that that went to, like, discover those things and it was you know also a journey of of you know what makes somebody a genius as well like Fitz's genius was that he could see things in words he wasn't formally educated in linguistics his nightmare was that Ted would represent himself and tear him apart on the stand because he was only a you know a graffiti cop who liked crossword puzzles and that's the kind of the, the emotional pull of this movie you got two men who are one with an IQ of 167 and another guy who was a beat cop on the you know on the sprint wiping graffiti off the walls, um, who thinks that they can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with each other intellectually yeah. and push each other. And at the same time, I think they're both their worst enemy and both their closest friend. 
And that's what was interesting to me. It wasn't just a normal procedural show like CSI or Law and Order, which are shows that I love, <laughs> but um, it, it had something which was a bit more depth, which was about watching two guys, um, you know, passionately pursue something, passionately both pursue ideals, but at what cost to their families, friends, and in this guy, to a lot of his victims, you know, physically. Yeah. I was going to say that, you know, you have this this fight between them, but then you also have Fitz kind of struggling with the, the family aspect of his life and, and being there for his wife and children when he's yeah. trying to... I looked at it as the, this guy was going, he, you know, the manifesto, there's certain parts of the manifesto that I actually believe in, I actually agree. I totally disagree with how he went about trying to get hurt. But there's stuff in there that I do think is relevant to society and we deal with that in the show. You know, stuff that we are becoming slaves to our own kind of uh, systems and technologies that we created to be that slaves for us. Um, and but in order to get his story out, he blew people up. Um, just kind of you know crazy. This guy emotionally blew up the world around him. I think he was passionately so driven to to be accepted and to to catch this guy and prove himself that in, yeah in the interim he blew up his friends, his family, his colleagues, all for this guy. So we examine in the show this kind of passionate bond between these two men. Yeah, that's kind of creepy when it sounds it, but when you watch it and do it, um, it has a bit of a kind of a, a solid bit of depth to it. Yeah, it, it brings that extra, like you said, something people didn't know. We've seen a lot of uh, 90s crime series now come about with OJ and we had the Menendez brothers. And um, is that was that important to you to give viewers something? You know, we all have heard Every of Timely talking about OJ today, isn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's his parole hearing, right? Yeah. Fingers crossed. Um, is that something that you wanted to make sure that you gave viewers something new, something different that they hadn't heard about with the story, um, and they get to visualize it and watch it on screen? Yeah, I mean, the, it, it was a fascinating time of crime in the 90s, and I think when you see Janet Reno's desk in episode four, you know, we recreated her desk and everything that was on it, and you see that, like, Unabom was one of 10 things she had going at once, Oklahoma, uh, Atlanta Centennial Park, uh, Whitewater, Monica Lewinsky, uh, Waco, all those were like on her desk at any given time. And it was a much more tangible, tactile time. And the uncertainty of Menendez and OJ really you know, made why they had to pursue a guilty plea. And the to... internet was just starting, if you remember. So we, we were only knowing uh, our kind of business through the media, through newspapers, old fashioned style of communication. Now we all seem connected and everything is immediate. So back then, I think, you know, to be honest, I think it was a lot more scarier, but the shroud was coming off. Yeah. Can you see in like 20 years, though, uh, other shows being made about stuff that's happening in the world now? Or do you think, because like what you said, where it wasn't a constant conversation in the 90s where you had to pick up a paper to actually get the, the news, will it be different? I don't know. It's a good question. I, I'd be curious to see what, what has that longevity 20 years from now that's like happening in the last five, 10 years, you know? I mean, I think there was something, there was, it was just such a strange pocket. I mean, you know, McVeigh was at Waco. Uh, Oklahoma happens two years after Waco. Uh, O.J. Menendez, like, oh, the O.J., you know, Fitz talked about how they all stopped and watched the O.J. verdict. You know, it, it, these pop culture things, it was, everybody, it was just a different swirling time of that. I don't think we specifically targeted the 90s. It's just when this story took place and was compelling and a new way into it. You know, everybody's, zeroed in on the brother turning on the brother. But, you know, David and Ted hadn't seen each other in 25 years, so it's it's hard to manufacture a story out of that. They're really, the only way to tell the Unabomber story is through Fitz's point of view. And a lot of what the Unabomber wrote about in that manifesto has come true. <laughs> that's, the, that's the other weird thing. Yeah, 100%. It, it was, if you can separate the message from the bomber, the the it was a prophecy of what would happen. He could see, you know, what would happen with, you know, over socialization, too many people in one place being all packed in on each other. You could see that technology, you know, I mean, you think about it, like, you know, it's there, you know, it's a, your phone's a tool for you, but like every time it beeps, you pull it out. So it owns you, it controls you and your action. Like just on a micro level, you could see all those systems happening around us 20 years later. Yeah. When it beeps, we jump. Yeah. Jeez, that's crazy. Um, I do want to, before I go to the audience question, I'm, I'm very in, uh, interested in how TV, and especially like with the Discovery Channel now, getting into the game of, of original programming and really stepping it up and getting in the mix. Um, why do you think television series right now are so popular? And why are people... I can tell you why this is a perfect fix for Discovery. I was yeah. trying to think about this the other day with my mate. And we, we watched the fishing show, Deadliest Catch. Mm -hmm. 
and the Gold Rush shows, the Bering Sea Gold Rush. I love all Shark that stuff. Shark Week, woo! Yeah, I like the I like the crazy ones though, the Yukon Gold. Yeah, <laughs> I like that thing. Um, I really dig them. And then my mate was going, "Why do you like them so much? Why why did this go on that that channel? It's odd." And I said, "Well, I think I like, it's all the mechanics. You see the mechanics of how it, what it takes to do the crabbing out in the North Sea, and you'd see the crabbing of not the crabbing. You see the mechanics of what it takes to you know gold mine." This is the mechanics of what it took to take down a terrorist at a time when we didn't have the internet and we didn't have such global communication. It was just pure brain power and pure tenacity. And that's what the eight episodes kind of deal with. And I think that's what Discovery uh, went with. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and, you know, and to you know, unpack a bigger story, like to be able to like, I think, I think there's a, a love of detail out there. I think the services that I think Discovery is a great place for it because it just, you know, you're, you're not only on this, you know, something very much designed. It's not a docudrama. It is a full psychological thriller, you know, and that's the that's the great propulsive part of the show. And also along the way, you know, to Sam's point, it's the detail, it's the mach it's the mechanics, it's lear I think everybody will leave the show a little bit smarter and feeling that they like were along for that journey and learned about a new side of criminal science. Yeah. Can't wait for you guys to see it, but I'm sure you guys have some questions for these guys. Here we go right here. Uh, hi, thanks for coming out. The trailer looked insane, and she touched on it earlier where it came across more like a movie and then touched across how Discovery Channel's kind of a weird fit for it, or at least it would seem. To me, it kind of seemed like a show that I would have to binge. Like, I would want to watch them like, all just in a row and just ruin a day. Was there ever a talk about hooking up with a streaming network like uh, Netflix or Amazon, or how did you guys get hooked up with Discovery Channel? Um, it came in, John Golden is our producer, and he, you know, he put Andrew and my, you know, onto the project to write it and, and me on to direct it. And, you know, it was not, it was, you know, I think it's the kind of show that, that really encourages a weekly conversation. So I'm glad that it's not there. Obviously somebody could wait seven weeks and just watch it all at once. But I think it's, it's that comp because I think you need that week to digest and to like talk about it and to be able to get the conversation out there. So I love that it'll come on week to week. Something I prefer because I think when things binge while I like I like it as a consumer I never know where people are to be able to talk about it like you know as they are week to week I was going to say guys uh, don't you miss the weekly like watching it and discussing it like with the Game of Thrones or something like that you never know with a with a Netflix when you're binge watching it you you never know when people are going to talk about it and when you it's going to hit you can't talk to those people when you're in your underwear <laughs> <laughs> are you a binge watcher in my underwear yes <laughs> Who's next? Right here. Hi, this question is for Mr. Worthington. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Not to get off topic, but you were awesome in Avatar. Can't wait for the others. So yeah, 2020, 20, when, when is this happening? <laughs> so my question to you is, out of all the eight episodes you shot for this show, which of them was your favorite to film? The fifth. Cool. Yeah, Sam's. <laughs> um, Sam, what happens in uh, the, 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 <laughs> the, the The fifth one is... I think in about the fifth one is when they both lose their minds. And I kept saying to, to Greg on the top of my script, I just wrote madness. So you're saying that to a director, they get a bit scary. Because they go, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, at that point, no one believed anything that Fitz was doing was right. He'd been ostracized by the rest of the FBI. I think he actually got bumped down to the behavioral analysis unit, like get out of you, the Unabomber task force, and get out of here. You, 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 you're not proving anything. You're not doing anything constructive. And so it kind of sent him a bit loopy. And in that time, he kind of started discovering the actual stuff he needed to actually really get zero in on proving that he was he's the guy that wrote the manifesto. So the more I kind of kept doing it, the more I kept saying, look, if someone's pushing their family aside and their kids aside and they're just going for it no matter what, they're going into a stream of madness like a downward spiral. So, and that's always fun, you know. It gets you out of the kind of the suit and tie kind of look and gets you having a bit of fun on the, in the day on set. So that was a good episode for me. That's definitely the, the got ready in his The fifth episode is the fourth night, and it's it's where David Kaczynski really comes in in that that drama and conflict and the collision of Fitz and David, and then Fitz with all everything else in his life starts to fall apart. And just like the acting of that piece, it's like a. Well, I wanted to be like Gollum, <laughs> so yeah. I kept saying to I kept saying to Greg, "This is Gollum. He wants the ring. The ring is the information." I would send him gifts of Gollum, and yeah, like, and, and I like, kept and playing it like Gollum. I'd get down on all fours, <laughs> and you see it. He let me go with it. He's crazy, <laughs> but it's yeah. Gollum wants the inf wants the ring. He's wants the information to get Ted Kaczynski. So 
he starts getting it, and it's, it's his precious. It's a good way to put it. I could see you prepping in your underwear, binge watching, and then uh, like acting out Gollum. That's horrendous. Did you give Andy but Circus a yeah, call? Yeah. Every day it'd be like he's like he's like ah, I'm, I'm mate, I'm Gollum. I'm like <laughs> I'm like all right, like all right, I'm down. Like what are we gonna do? Like, oh, yeah, you're just you're gonna like it. So. <laughs> all right, we have time for one more. Hi, thanks for coming. Looks really interesting to watch. Um, without revealing, obviously, too much of the plot, can you talk about what was one of the most surprising things you found out about this story while you were making it? I mean, first of all, I think getting everybody to realize that the 90s are a period show, you know, like everybody's like, what? Oh, that was, oh, shit, that was 20 years ago. Yeah. You know, like that, like seeing everybody, that dawn on everybody. But the, um, you know, I, I'd say, that, you know, one of the biggest challenges was, was, or, or something to be aware of was just making sure that there was empathy, you know, on how we approach the TED story to present it and let the audience decide how they feel about it and not just have like a black and white. Nobody is all good or all bad in the show. And with that, it's like, that's the thing. It's you're not glorifying a terrorist. It's very hard, kind of, you gotta be very delicate because people did get blown up and people are still suffering 20 years from now because they lost loved ones. There's a part, I think, towards the end where we hear the actual transcripts from people being put, you know, read to by, by actors, but, but it's the actual words that were used by the victims at his, at his trial. That's when it really kind of hit home to me and went, whoa, this isn't some kind of cool dude in a hood and, and sunglasses. This guy actually built bombs that harmed people. And as long as we kind of always remembered that, that this, even though we're trying to present something entertaining and thrilling, it did happen and you've got to kind of you know, handle it with some delicacy. Mm -hmm. so. That's the hard part when it's, it's based in truth and it, and it happens. You have to, especially in the time we're living in too now, um, but it's a great, great show, guys. Eight episodes, and it starts August 1st, yes, at 9 p.m. on Discovery. So make sure to watch it. Thank you both for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having us. Really cool stuff. Thank you.